Well, you may have noticed from various shades of green and orange in the room, there's a basketball game today. And uh, a lot of us are going to be going to the Oregon, Oregon State women's basketball game after this. And so some people are just ready for that now. Talk about showing your colors, huh, worship team today, Oregon State up here. Um, if you've been around our church for long, you have probably recognized that we have many fine Oregon State alum. And so moments like these are always, always fun. Um, you know, many of you may know this about me, but I'm sure there's, there's a handful that don't, that before we moved to Eugene, I was actually up in Corvallis. I was a campus minister up there and did various roles within our church at Grace City Corvallis. And I was a very intense Oregon State fan. <clears throat> Anybody that knows me from back in the day knows that I was one of those intense Oregon State fans that actually like hated the Ducks. You know, there's like, oh, I'm an Oregon State fan. And then there's like, Oregon State, I bleed orange if you are from down south, like, to heck with you. I, I was that guy. Um, I believe that Oregon was just Uncle Phil's chosen ones, and that was the only reason they had any sort of influence or success. And I liked that Oregon State had to work for what they had. That's a good school, good hardworking, you know, ethics. And, um, <laughs> and Oregon State at that point in my life especially definitely identified more with my ideologies than what I knew of the Eugene area. So this, this was pre-Eugene Chris. Um, then I progressed to where this one year I realized that if the Ducks won the Civil War game, that they would go to the national championship or something like that. I don't remember what year it was. And I was like, well, that would be okay. And then I was like, what? I want to take myself out and beat myself up. I was like, what are you, what, where did that come from? I was like, well, I mean, that'd be cool, right, for Oregon? Like, go team, like, state, camaraderie, all that. And <clears throat> then I eventually came around. We moved down here to plant a church, and I graduated from the University of Oregon with a sociology degree. So I've been on a unique journey in this Oregon, Oregon State world, and I, I think it's, it's fair to say this is a pretty intense rivalry for many people, right? Like if you've grown up in the state, especially, um, unless you're like, I remember Lindsay in college, she's like, I'm going to Oregon State, but I've been a Duck fan my whole life. Casey went through that. There's people that are platypuses and have had to, you know, walk the balance of, of both worlds. But for the most part, people have very intense feelings about this rivalry. It's an intense one for a lot of people. And inherent in any rivalry, there are things that, like, you just grab and you use for ammunition because it's convenient, right? Like, oh, well, Nike, you know, they just give everything to Oregon. Like, okay, cool. If you were there, you'd be okay with that. But when you're up north, you're like, to heck with them. They just get all this stuff for free. Like, it's very surface level, but you start to grab at things that don't really matter, but they matter because of your pre-existing hate and disdain for something, right? Like, that, that's how some things go with with rivalries, but oftentimes they're rooted out of like a real difference, a real deep ideological difference over territory, over some sort of familial or tribal differences, and there can be different layers to rivalries. And the reality is, now more than ever, at least in my lifetime, we live in a world of rivalries, amen? Like, not too hard to see rivalries all around us. You have Republican Democrat, you have PC Mac, shout out Team Mac, you have Coke and Pepsi, you got Ford and Chevy, we all know the right answer to that one, Android and iPhone, we have these kind of consumer rivalries around us, but even aside from that, there are kind of tribal, social, geographical rivalries all around us. And unfortunately, some of these rivalries even turn violent, where people are killed due to cultural and racial hostilities, like this idea of rivalries and the tension and conflict that can come out of them is not just a surface like, haha, no, I'm team iPhone, but like it runs deep and it can bring a lot of harm and hatred and hostility into the world. So as we get into today, I'd ask you to just consider like what kind of rivalries maybe consume some of your mind in your life? Whether surface level or deeper, what kind of rivalries creep up in your life? 
Maybe it's around sports. Maybe it's around the make of a vehicle or the gym you work out at or different coworkers and you have kind of your clique and we're cool, they're not, we'll do our thing. We're gonna, we're, we actually carry all the weight of this office, right? Maybe you got some kind of coworker rivalry. Maybe it's with kids and your kids in sports. That's like compounding rivalries, right? Maybe it's other churches or other church people that you have rivalries with or people that don't look like you or share your values or vote like you. We live in a world of rivalries, and I believe it's important as we get into the Word today to take an honest assessment of what kind of rivalries, no matter how surface level or how deep, are present in our lives. Amen. Just think about that. Yeah, that's one for me. <laughs> Absolutely, right? And, and come to terms with that. What kind of walls or barriers, then, do you put up around yourself to insulate yourself from these opposing views and ideologies and teams in your life. So not just, yeah, here's, here's some of these rivalries that are present and consume at least some of my mind, some of my mental space, and some of my social space. But then what are some of the mechanisms that you have developed over the years to insulate and protect yourself from the implications of those rivalries? Or from the effects of the other. Like, what are, what are some of those things in your own life? And I believe any good battle plan, which every Sunday, spoiler alert, we're talking about a battle we're engaged in as people who are following the way of Jesus. What does the word say about it and how do we take steps in overcoming that, right? It's, it's a battle plan every week. I don't use that verbiage every week. But in any good battle plan, you first need to identify the enemy and you need to identify the lies or the false ways of dealing with those things that you have come up with. So in this case, what are those rivalries and what have you used to insulate or incubate that rivalry in your own life? <clears throat> now, to see what God says about this whole idea of rivalries and hostility and opposition, today we're going to be in the book of Ephesians. I'm going to read through a few verses in chapter 2 and then we're going to dig in and see how this applies to this concept of rivalries, and specifically how those function in our lives and what the good news is coming out of this. Amen? So you can turn with me to chapter 2 in Ephesians, or you can read on the screens because we're super accommodating like that. Amen, says Chris. Ephesians chapter 2, we're going to be starting in verse 11. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done by the body or in the body by human hands, remember that at the time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace." And in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself is the chief cornerstone, and in him the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. Father, I thank you for your word. I pray that you would speak through it to us today. God, I pray that you would use the words that come out of my mouth to bring understanding and that they would be honoring and glorifying to you. Holy Spirit, would you come? Would you open our ears and our hearts to receive your word and your leading here this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Rivalries. In the book of Ephesians here, we get to see Paul address a pretty heated, multi-dimensional rivalry. This isn't a sports rivalry. This isn't a consumer goods rivalry. This is 
something that runs into the very bones and DNA of the people that he is speaking to. In chapter 2, these verses 11 through 22, Paul describes a deep, complex, hostile rivalry between the Jews and the Gentiles. Gentiles at this time would be non-Jews, so it's Jews and everybody else. Now, this rivalry was, was religious as the Gentiles did not know the God of Israel. It was also cultural because Jews had rituals and they had feasts and ceremonies that distinguished them from the nations, that differentiated them from everybody else. So this wasn't just a religious thing, it was also a cultural thing. And it was also a racial thing. The Jews could boast of having the blood of Abraham running through their body. The blood of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob was running through their veins, and they would boast on that, and they would stand on that as actually the means of their salvation. You see, this rivalry was deep. It was multifaceted. It was religious. It was cultural, and it was racial. And then we see here in Ephesians 2, the first two verses we read, it says, Therefore remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves a circumcision, remember that at the time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. Now, what we see Paul doing here is he is highlighting both what we could consider shallow ceremonial differences of the flesh and also some legitimate differences between these people groups as things stood at this point in time. Now, this is pretty common in any rivalry, right? Like I mentioned earlier, we, we'll point out everything and we'll say, well, here's the legitimate reasons why I hate you and why my ancestors hated you and why everybody that has ever been in my family line has hated y'all. But then on top of that, because I view you through this pre-lens of like hatred, now I'm going to pick all these other things that just annoy me and I'm going to consider them wrapped into this bundle of rivalry. I'm going to consider annoyances, actual grievances, and I'm going to operate out of those things. We like to point out some things that are surface level, mainly illegitimate differences, and then we like to point out the things that run deeper, the legitimate differences, either physical and appearance, which would be that racial divide that we see here, geographical, kind of tribal location-wise, or spiritual and ideological, the, the ideals that you orient your life and your future around. So Paul highlights these things. He makes them very clear, and then he goes on to say, but... You always pay attention when you're reading the scripture and it says, it says something and it says, but, comma, right? It's, it's, he's about to address that. But what? But what is he addressing? Starting in verse 13, he says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by what? By the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace who has made the two groups one and destroyed the barrier the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace so that you were far, who were far from peace and to those who were near, for, though, for through him, we have both access to the Father by one Spirit. So, but what is he saying? He's saying, but Christ has come and dealt with those differences. So yeah, we have these differences, some surface level, some that run very deep. And generations have based their biases and their future and their entire way in which they relate socially around. But Christ came and dealt with these differences. He's come to deal with that rivalry. That rivalry has become illegitimate because of the sacrifice of Jesus. Because he came to bring two into one new humanity. That rivalry, that, that hostility, that is no longer legitimate. Because we know that Jesus came to bring us peace. To make us one. To bring unity amongst us. To put death to hostility, to preach peace to those who know him and those who didn't. He came to preach peace to everybody, not some chosen bloodline, to everybody. And ultimately to give us access to God, to redeem our relationship and our access to him. 
And then in verses 19 through 22, Paul finishes up saying, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. So consequently, what is the answer to all of this hostility, all of these things that bring division, that bring hate, that cause this this rivalry? The answer to deal with all of this is the church. The church. You see that. Fellow citizens, members of this household, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus as the cornerstone, joined together to be a holy temple in the Lord, to become a dwelling place in which God lives by his spirit. Now, there's a vertical and a horizontal purpose to Christ's death. And you've probably heard this in a million sermons if you've been walking with Jesus. Vertical and horizontal. Oh, it's the cross, right? Like, very convenient illustration. However, there is a vertical and a horizontal purpose to his death. And we've talked about this vertical purpose, the individual purpose that we get adopted into sonship. We become a child with full rights of a child of God. We get reconciled to him. It's about our relationship vertically with him. But here, Paul is talking about the horizontal purpose to be reconciled to others, to abolish hostility and rivalries and divides and reconcile across the span of humanity. And smack dab in the middle of this vertical and horizontal reconciliation of this cross is the death and resurrection of Jesus. Dying the death that we should have died to give us new life in him. To be brought back into relationship with our Father in heaven and with each other. The church, make no mistake, is a big deal to God. It's a big deal to God. And that's why it pains me when I hear people that would say, I believe every word in the Bible. I follow Jesus. I just don't need the church. And yes, the church, unfortunately, like people in the church have hurt people. Absolutely. Because people just do that. We're not Jesus. We're not perfect. But it it pains me when I hear people who say they are following the way of Jesus talk down about or talk poorly about the church. Because I don't know about you, but if you said something about my bride, we're going to step outside and have words. I might lose my pastor card, but hey, I protect my bride. What does the Bible call the church? The bride of Christ. I do not want to talk any smack about the bride of Christ. It's kind of a big deal to him. Now, not just because it's his bride, but what that means. Genesis tells us that in the structure of a marriage, it paints the picture of a bride being a helper to come alongside and complete and complete a work that is happening. So the, the church comes alongside as the bride of Christ and it collaborates with him to complete his work, his restorative work here on earth. That is a big deal. The church is the mechanism through which God makes foreigners into family. He gives hope to the hopeless, and outsiders become sons and daughters and brothers and sisters. The church is the chosen mechanism to do these things. And so, family, we cannot disparage the church, but we can be a part of redeeming relationships from within it. Amen? I promise everybody one thing when they come into this church. Like, hey, I'm going to let you down. Let's just get this out the way right off the bat. And everybody in here at some point in time is going to let you down. They're going to hurt your feelings because we're a bunch of imperfect people doing our best to be as much like Jesus every day that we can. But here's the win. In family, if you get hurt, if somebody hurts your feelings, if you're offended, you stay, you work through it, and you see the victory on the other side in the name of Jesus. Amen? That's what happens in the church. We stay and we work through hard things and we work through difficult conversations so that Christ can be glorified in his redemptive work in our lives and in our relationships, both vertical and horizontal. 
The church is not just a building or a Sunday gathering. The church is a family of people saved through Jesus, brought together on mission to accomplish the purposes of the Father. That's what the church is. So what we're saying here, if I didn't make it clear enough, is the church is kind of a big deal to God. Hey, thanks for checking out our YouTube video today. We appreciate you taking the time to tune in with us. Before you take off, please hit the like button. And if you want more of this content and you want to be notified when we put out new videos, hit the subscribe button and the little bell for notifications right next to it. We'll look forward to seeing you next time.